World Update on CUBN. Thank you, producer. This is September 6, 2012, and things are getting weird. <laughs> Excuse me. The Russian internet looks like it might be going dark. Um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's acting odd and sites that we're used to being able to access are not being, not coming up when you put them in your browser. So, I, I mean, I don't know if it'll come back up, maybe if it's some kind of a glitch or what, but it's weird, don't you think? Uh, that's, you know, okay, we've got thousands of Syrian refugees crossing the border into Jordan. That situation is way out of hand. There's about 2,000 a day crossing the border there. Right now, Jordan is putting them into refugee camps. Right now, they've got 25,000 of these people in these refugee camps in the middle of the desert, they, it's not going to get any better any sooner. Actually, it's going to get worse. We know that as Damascus goes up in a mushroom cloud, when the time comes, <laughs> you're going to see a major, major exodus from Syria, even more than you see now. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a catch in my throat. Let me hit, turn my mic off real fast. I've got a catch in my throat. I don't know if I'm <laughs> I don't know if I'm trying to talk and breathe at the same time or what. Okay. Usain Bolt holds the record for being the fastest human being. Um he can run 27.78 miles per hour. But now the military has what they're calling a cheetah robot. It looks like a dog. And it is, it has set the new record. So now human beings, this poor Usain Bolt who hit this record, his record is shot and broken by the little military cheetah robot who can run 28.3 miles per hour. Now, they say that it is designed to carry equipment into combat. <laughs> yeah, this thing is small like a dog. 
It's got these little skinny legs that couldn't carry five pounds on it. I mean, who are they think they're kidding with this? These things are designed to outrun people is what they're doing. I mean, that's the context in which they gave it, too. It outruns the fastest person. That's not a, a very good thing, is it? Um, <laughs> producer, get ready here. Um, we've got a UFO spiral seen in Western Canada on Friday, okay? There's multiple angles of this thing. And I don't know, this one... This one's so different that I actually have to show it to you anytime you're ready in there. You got to see this. You, you got to check this out. Hello, I'm Brad Johnson, and welcome to this Disclosure 2010 update. There has been an incredible video that has been brought to my attention. I, rec I recently received it through email, and I took a look at it, and what was really interesting about this email, I mean, this uh, video at first, was when I just first took a glance at it the first couple of seconds, I said, ah, this is something to do with After Effects or something to do with Particle Illusion or something like that. And then I discovered that this video actually has multiple angles to which it was shot, and I looked at the report that the weatherspace.com uh, did on it, and it just blew me away. There's also multiple photographs from other different people that have actually taken uh, photographs of this particular event. And this happened in Western Canada on Friday night. So when we take a look at this, it's kind of a look back at the Norway spiral, but I think with this, I think it's even more spectacular because we're just seeing something we're literally seeing something almost like out of a science fiction movie here. This is incredible. Um, if this is truly authentic, then this is an incredible uh, piece of footage that we have here. It looks like some sort of, you know, bluish, whitish kind of light ship is uh, just pulling out, doing a curve, and then just shooting off, and like shooting out these like quantum kind of energetic sparks, and then hits this, I don't know, a warp gate, a time gate, a stargate, or something. And what's really interesting, too, is you can hear this two sonic booms in one particular clip. And the sonic booms are just so precisely calculated, it's, it just sounds like it's coming from a distance, just echoing across the valley from where it was shot in one of the videos. This is incredible. If this is truly authentic, if this truly is something uh, that truly happened Friday night in Western Canada, wow. This is definitely um, one of the best-looking UFO videos I've ever seen. So, again, if we're, if, you know, because we have photographs, multiple photographs taken from different people. We have several different angles of video. Uh, the weatherspace.com said that there was, if there was anybody else that had any uh, video shot or photo shot of this event Friday night to submit it to them. I'd like to know where about in Western Canada this was. It didn't really say in the article. Uh, it's in my neck of the woods. But this is just an incredible piece of footage, and it just blew me away just looking at it and just seeing all these different angles and seeing the, the photographs, and this is incredible. And, you know, I guess they're trying to look for a, uh, try and look for an explanation to find out what caused this. You know, there's no, uh, there's, there's currently no reports on any form of military operation or anything like that that uh, justified uh, doing this. So this is something that we're still taking a look at. It's just an incredible phenomenon. Um, <laughs> I was just at a loss for words. I just looked at it and my eyes just started to bulge. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. This is incredible. So if this is truly the real deal, if this truly is an authentic uh, bit of footage caught from all these different angles uh, with all these different photographs from different people, incredible. Probably the best form of UFO uh, footage that we have ever seen. So I will keep you up to date on this story as it develops. If there is more videos that come on in, in regards to this event, if there's more photos that come together in regards to this event, I'll definitely post it up on disclosure2009.blogspot.com. Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned.
Well. <laughs> now that is a piece of video right there, isn't it? Wow. Um, several different angles and... Uh, What do you think? What do you, hey guys in the chat room? Let's let's check in and see see who's over here. Oh hi Michelle and Janine and Joan, Joe from Maine. God bless you all. Let's see. Hi David. Nice to see you. Wow, guys, thanks for coming. Welcome. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them. Um, when I was wondering about what to teach on today, I talked to God in the shower. See, that's, that's really my time. Well, I mean, I have time with him 24-7, but in the shower is when I really focus my thoughts on him. And I am, (laughs) I'm busy thanking him for hot showers. Hot showers are such a wonderful thing. I remember as, you know, as a kid, when they were building our house, you know, our house sold so fast we had to get out of it. And then our new house that my parents were building wasn't finished yet. And so we ended up living in a small storage building with an outhouse and taking showers in a garden hose. And let me tell you what, a cold shower is a bummer. (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, you really, I have just treasured hot showers ever since. Isn't it funny how, how different things can make you thankful and for as you know, I'll be thankful for hot showers eternally after taking a few in a cold garden hose. But then, you know, if you want to take that even further, I should be thankful that there's even water coming out of a garden hose for me. Because in the days to come, the fresh water is going to say bye-bye. And it's going to be like drops of gold. And if you're wise, you have a a couple of weeks, at least, you know, of basics, like your medicines, um, batteries, flashlights, candles, you know, uh, non-perishable foods, and bottled water in case of an emergency, Now, that could, I mean, an emergency in the United States here is the power going down and not coming right back up, okay? It doesn't have to be some huge, you know, a bomb doesn't have to go off and there doesn't have to be some major disaster for us to find ourselves in a bit of a predicament, okay? Just make sure that you have a week or two of the basics. That's all. I mean, and those probably won't even, you know, have to be used by us before we go. You know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But if you have them, then at least you've got them. Okay? And if the if something terrible happens, you know, uh, we see down on the coast with Isaac, how things do tend to happen. And you just need some basic supplies in the event of disruption of services and things like that. Because, you know, we could have a a solar flare take our power grid down. You know, we're in a time of heightened solar activity right now, as well as seismic activity and volcanic activity such that you know, it, it's very possible that you could have power outages in many places. And like I say, a power outage is all it takes. 
okay? Because without power, you don't pump gas into your car. Without power, you can't buy anything at the, at the store. Everything is automated. So, anyway, like I say, it's just a good idea to have some basics just in case. And if, uh, if you don't need them, awesome, great, wonderful. And those in the tribulation may end up benefiting from your preparedness. And if we are, you know, if the rapture of the believers is what ends up causing the emergency, because that's going to turn the world upside down. And that's part of what I wanted to talk to you about today. I know we discussed the rapture quite a bit. But what I'm actually wanting to focus on right now is what you're going to do personally when you face these situations that are ahead of us. 46.7 million people on food assistance alone in the United States. The U.S. government is feeding 46 million people, almost 47 million three times a day. And what are you going to do when the government requires you to take a chip in your hand or in your forehead to continue getting assistance? Because this is reality, folks. When the cupboard is bare and the fridge is bare and there's nothing to eat, and your babies are crying, and you're starving, and you have no resources, no ability to get any more. What are you going to do? That's something that you that you just absolutely must think of ahead of time. And I understand why the king would want us to focus on this, because those who... I really don't believe we will face this situation until the rapture of the believers has already occurred. So if you are on government assistance and you have chosen the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you are following him, then you'll go in the rapture. You won't be here to be faced with that situation because, yeah, the government is getting everyone you know, to where they have to depend on them. And then it looks like they've been pretty successful at it too, haven't they? Almost 47 million people in our country are having a hard time. And a lot of it has to do with what the government has done to us. And taxing us to death, it's ridiculous. And you know what? People are losing their homes. Because Timothy Geithner was saying, did an interview saying that they did that purposely. The bailout money that was supposed to go and help homeowners keep their homes went to, four million of it went to American Express credit card company. What's up with that? Four million dollars to bail out American Express. People are losing their homes in this country and they're going to go hungry to refuse the mark. It's absolutely imperative that you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and hand your life over to him immediately. Because when the rapture occurs and those who currently trust in him are evacuated and relocated, you are going to find yourself in a world that you've never even imagined. Everything good has been taken out of the world at that point. There are no believers left. The only, the only people left, which will be a way whole lot of people, there won't be, you know, a small percentage will disappear compared to the number in the population of the world. 
But those who are left are godless, wicked, or just haven't made a decision about Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a world unlike you can imagine on this side of the rapture. We're on the front side of the rapture now. But you're talking about a situation where all the little children are gone. A darkness like you've never imagined. Uh, It sounds to me like we're about to go to a break. Um, Stay tuned. We'll be back shortly. Producer, are we going to break or are we not? Okay. Well, I'll just keep teaching if we're not. Okay. I guess we are. (laughs) Yeah. 
Thanks for listening. Welcome back to Believer's Central World Update on CUBN TV. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We're discussing a pretty serious topic today um, that the Lord has put on my heart. I have some weird things to tell you. Um, I don't really know what to make of it. So I'm just going to give you some information and let you kind of kick it around and you know, I don't know if it means anything. It may not mean anything, okay? Um, but I have to testify to you that um, I work really late into the night because I disciple believers on the other side of the planet as well. And so I usually set my alarm for about noon, because, I, you know, it's not unusual for me to get to bed somewhere in the, you know, four or five o'clock area in the morning. And, and so um, I set my alarm for noon. But something weird has been happening. Um, the last couple, well, I can, the last couple weeks... I keep waking up at 9-11. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay? It's really unusual. And I keep brushing it off like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> but it's happening too many times here. Okay? This has happened to me like eight or ten times now. <laughs> In the last couple of weeks. And, you know, it only happens once a day because I... I only wake up at 9-11, you know, in the mornings. It doesn't happen at night or anything like that. But it's it's so many times now that I am I have to pay attention. Now, I don't know if it means anything, you know. I mean, I have no idea what it means. And I'm not a person who really gets into numbers, you know what I mean? I don't uh, study what... I don't study numerology or anything like that, okay? I just study the scripture. So I don't really, you know, I don't know what numbers mean, and I don't think that that's what God is asking of me here. So what I started doing, when, when God's trying to tell me something, he's trying to tell me something he's already said in his word. That's the way he speaks to us. So if you get some off-the-wall message, you know, don't pay any attention to it. Now, the only reason I'm paying attention to this is because it's happened like eight or ten times now. I didn't even count. I just thought, that's weird. That's weird. And it just keeps happening. And it happened again this morning. So I don't know. You know, like I say, I don't know what to make of it. But this is the 6th of September. And September 11th is only five days away. And I'm ha waking up at 9-11. And I don't know. I mean... I have no idea what to make of it, okay? I'm not saying anything is going to happen on that day. I don't know. I have no idea. But I know I have to mention it to you because it's weird, okay? <laughs> it's it, And it's continuing to happen to me, and I don't know why. Now, when I'm... When when God gives me, I mean, I'm I guess I'm starting to think <laughs> that God is get, telling me something. Okay? And I need to figure out what it is. But it's not the meaning of numbers. It's scripture. Okay? Now, so what I did is I went to Genesis and I started at the front of the Bible and I started looking this morning at every book of the Bible, chapter 9, verse 11. Okay, because when God's given me numbers, he's taking me to the Bible. I mean, I'm not going to look at some number chart and think God's trying to tell me something like that. I'm going to look in the scriptures in chapter 9, verse 11 of every book of the Bible and see what it's saying. So I got as far as Chronicles and I was astounded. 
by what I was reading. Okay. Um, and I think through, uh, what we might do is go through some of these. And so you can see what's, what these verses are saying. Let me go over here to where I've got it all written down. I'll, I'll tell you what these verses say to me as we go. We've got Genesis 9, 11 says, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And when I considered that, what came to my mind in, was to remember God's promise. The earth will be destroyed by fire this time instead of water. Exodus 9:11 And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians So this is a tribulation event as well see this literally happened all those years ago but it's also foreshadowing future events we've been talking about the judgments and about the boils that are going to come on these people it's very disturbing. I mean, a boil, you know how bad a boil hurts. And to have them all over your body, oh, that just is terrible. Um, Leviticus 9-11. And the flesh and the hide, he burnt with fire without the camp. Outside the camp. This is not Israel. Outside the camp, people are going to die by fire. Um, that, anyway, that's, that's what I understand from this. That's what I think when I read this scripture in that context. Um, Numbers 9-11, the 14th day of the second month, at even they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This was the Passover. They're talking about the Messiah, they're talking about the Passover lamb, that they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now, what I got from this is that the Jews will get the knowledge inside them, finally, that Jesus is the Savior, but it will be a very bitter pill for them to swallow. It, they will, you know, you've got bitter herbs and unleavened bread, which are the bitterness of the situation they found themselves in, the bitterness of their captivity in Egypt, which they will go into again during the, you know, as the Antichrist runs them down during the second half of the tribulation period. It's going to just be um, really bad for them at that time. Deuteronomy 9-11 and it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. Now you're back to Old Testament rules in after the rapture. The world goes back to the law for Daniel's 70th week of years. And if you're a believer in the tribulation period, you got to live it. Okay. Now before the rapture, it's all the blood of the king. And not our works, lest any should boast. But during the tribulation period, after the rapture of the believers, you're back to God 101, Old Testament, physical parables. You're, you know, nobody who's left behind knows God. So Israel is once again a beacon to the world, the God 101 program. And they go right back to the beginning. God takes the world right back to the beginning of the Bible and starts all over again, except the whole thing happens in a very short period of time. These tribulation saints are going to have to learn fast, um, and they're going to have to have a real knack for survival. Millions will be slaughtered. Um, Joshua 9-11, Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us saying, take victuals with you for the journey and go to meet them 
and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make ye a league with us. Israel enters into the agreement with hell. That's what this scripture is saying to me. The treaty that starts the tribulation period. Um, are, are you noticing a pattern to all these 9-11s, 9-11, 9-11 on these scriptures? They're all talking about the end times. They're all talking about our generation right now. Um, let's go over here to Judges now, 9-11. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? The fig tree is Israel. Forsaking their good fruit is their, their Messiah. They once again misidentify their Messiah. And they instead enter into an agreement with the world and the prince of this world who is, you know, um, about to be given his final short time. But anyway, what that uh, says to me is that Israel forsakes Christ, their good fruit, and accepts Antichrist as their Messiah, bowing to Satan in exchange for uh, the removal of the existential threat against them. And that would be a very, very big mistake. 1 Samuel 9-11, And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the seer here? And when I thought about this, I was looking at what came to my mind was Israel looking for prophets to tell them what to do, looking, from, looking for their God to hear from him. 2 Samuel 9.11 Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded, and his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, I can say this, Mephibosheth, <laughs> okay, there we go. As for, Me I shouldn't have tried it more than once. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Now, Mephibosheth <laughs> was Saul's youngest son. He was crippled and ill, and David, uh, when he became king, he didn't want Mephibosheth uh, exiled or killed. He kept him at the king's table. And what this, but he was, he was, he was retained because he was pathetic. Bless his heart. He was no threat to the king. The king saw him as no threat. This is a, um, this is a very interesting scripture here because what it looks to me is that David kept the son of Saul who was pitiful, ill, crippled at the king's table because he was so pathetic. Israel will sit like a pet at the Antichrist's table. That's just going to be terrible. And he's going to be in charge, and they're just going to be like Mephibosheth at the table. Aren't you impressed that I could say that a couple times without messing it up? Well, I did mess it up a bunch of times. But anyway, I probably couldn't say it again if my life depended on it. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, first Kings nine eleven. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold, according to all his desire that then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Okay. The Antichrist returns much of the Holy lands to Israel's control. We know that. The tetrads of blood moons that are coming also indicate wars where Israel um, gains more land. Okay? And so we have uh, the Antichrist returns much of the Holy Lands to Israel's control. We expect that from the wars that are coming as Israel's enemies die in huge numbers. The um, Arab-Israeli conflict. The Arabs... When they move against Jerusalem, there is a madness of some kind that falls upon them, and they will turn and kill each other. Um, Israel won't even have to do it. 
And so it's, um, you know, that's something that I think God has a hand in there. Obviously, he has a hand in everything. Um, Let's look here at 2 Kings 9-11. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord. And one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto them, Ye know the man and his communication. This passage of scripture is talking about how Jehu, who was a rece- who was a deceiver, um, he conspired his way into becoming king over Israel. And this could be a leader in Israel's government who rises to power um, and is in cahoots with the Antichrist, who will declare him the Messiah and hand over his power to the beast. And that's going to be a very bad thing. First Chronicles 9-11. And Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of Marioth, the son of Ahitub, the ruler of the house of God. Now, this is a list of priests. And so I have no idea what, you know, um, I don't know if that's a priesthood that has um, been replaced or what, but I I have no idea what that one is, is saying. And that is where I wound up my study, but I'm going to continue and go through, um, and go through these scriptures. I'm going to go through every book in the Bible (laughs) and I'm going to pull out chapter nine, verse 11, and I'm going to ask God what he's trying to tell me. And, you know, I don't know if I'll have any answers. I don't know. But it looks like we're going to a break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. My God, you Sun, who's walked away. 
Praise the King of Kings. Welcome back to Believer Central World Update on CUBN TV. We're so happy to have you. We're in the middle of some pretty serious stuff here. And guys, how are we doing in the chat room before we move on? Oh, thank you, Michelle. A happy face for me. Oh, bless your heart. It's a sugar. Thank you. I see. Okay. Let's see. I love you guys. I'm so glad you're here. I'm trying to scan the comments here. And um, I'm going to keep going here with our um, with our topic as far as This 9-11 stuff, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know what to make of it, okay? I don't have weird dreams. God doesn't appear to me. I don't hear an audible voice, all right? I don't have weird mystical things happen to me, okay? God doesn't do things that way. At least I've not known him to do that. And I mean, the only mystical stuff I've ever experienced was demonic. Okay. Now I'm not saying that, you know, if you've experienced something that it's demonic, I'm saying from my own perspective, um, what's wrong with our, okay. Um, from my own perspective, God doesn't deal with me in mystical ways. Okay. I don't have weird dreams. I hardly ever, you know, I'll dream. I dream happy things all the time. I, I dream, um, about rainbows and flowers and my grandbabies and my kids. I mean, I always dream about happy things. Okay. I don't have nightmares and it's, it's just weird this 9-11 thing, because, I, w- I mean, it's happened to me eight or ten times, and I've yet to really, I mention it once on my wall after five or six times, but that's all. I mean, I I don't put stock in weird things, okay? I put stock in the Word of God alone, and when, but I do think something is up, <laughs> because, you know, it, Eight or ten times of this happening to me in the last two weeks, that's just weird. Okay? It's very unusual. That doesn't happen to me. I sleep like a baby. I don't wake up, you know, at 9-11 every day. And I've never woken up at 9-11, in case you're wondering, because, I I mean, I've never even set my alarm for anything close to that. And my alarm goes off at noon because I work through the night a lot. But... It's weird, okay? I I don't know. Maybe 9-11 will come and go, and it's not a date. You know, maybe it's not a date. Maybe it's a scripture. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Because I'm not, when when God's trying to tell me something, he leads me to the scripture, okay? Now, that's why we went through several of these 9-11s. I don't know what, what do you guys think about that? I mean, do you think it's weird? Do you think there's could be something to it? Let's look in the chat room. Or right, what are we going on over here? Okay, here. Let's see what Glenn has to say. Um, here's the problem. Oh, oops, it moved up. Glenn says, "Here's the problem. You're taking a verse and turning it into what you want it to say. When the Bible is to." When the Bible is to be discerned in complete context, only to gain knowledge of God's true meaning. I agree. But I'm not going to turn it into what I wanted to say. Okay? I'm telling you the truth about what, about how I interpret the verse when just that one verse as I read it. Okay? Now, I also look at the entire passage to see what the actual literal context is as well, which is why we explained a while ago about that one verse that was telling us about the Passover, okay? 
it was talking about the Passover. It's talking about, you know, uh, the lamb without blemish. We know that's Christ. And the bitter herbs was the bitterness of their bondage. And the unleavened bread was the bread of haste where they, it was a speedy exodus. It was something that had to be done quickly. And I'm thinking, you know, I like a speedy exodus. Rapture will be a real speedy exodus, won't it? Let's see what's going on here. Um, What else? Um, Let's see. It keeps scrolling up before I can read anything. (laughs) Let's see. Okay. Is everybody getting wigged out at what I'm telling you? (laughs) I'm not telling you anything other than I'm not saying that 9-11 is going to be anything at all. Actually, you know, I really don't think it's a date when God gives it to me. I think it's a scripture. And so that's why I'm looking at all the scriptures. Um, Let's see. I can't read some of this little print. Let me take a look at what you guys are saying. Now, Becca, she is admitting that she's biased toward the hope that's within her. I got to amen that. Okay. Amen. I'm <laughs> I'm biased toward the hope that's within me, too. I'm going to cling to hope, even if there's only a teeny, tiny little sliver. <laughs> okay. Now, let's see. Gosh, I must be blind. I can't read this stuff. Um, let's see. Smiler Dog says, Biased, just saying that we ain't getting out of judgment of America as a nation. We will be protected through it, but we got to go through it. Well, America is definitely going to be judged. You know, there's no question about that. Nobody's Nobody here is saying that America is not going to be judged. Now, if you're, um, if you're talking about the believers escaping judgment, now I do believe that, yes, we are going to escape the judgment, the actual judgments from God, the 21 judgments, the seal judgments, trumpet judgments, and vile judgments. Those are not for the current believers who will be raptured. The believers um, will not be judged. I know that's going to freak a bunch of you out. I, you know, it's okay. I don't mind. The believers are not going to be judged. We don't appear at a judgment. The scripture tells us that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So you can't be judged unless you die. All right. Now, the believers who have died since Jesus left 2,000 years ago, all the way up until now, they have separated from their physical bodies, but it's not the same type of death as what the lost suffer. Okay. Those who die without Christ, they die. Okay. Their deaths are permanent. They're not, you know, they will be resurrected um, at the judgment of the lost at the at the end of the millennium, but that's not going to be fun for them. They're not going to be happy about it. It's going to send them to their second death. But the believers are resurrected like Lazarus was, back to life, and we will all stand together on the planet at the same time, and then we will all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Glory to God. Um, Now, I know it really freaks religious people out when I say we won't be judged. But that is what I get from the scriptures. And I'll show you um, a scripture that says we won't be judged. Let's just go after it right now. And... um, The, the rapture saints don't appear at the beam of judgment because we inherit the kingdom, 
okay? Now, those who inherit the kingdom are the bride. That's the, she is joined with Christ and is a joint heir with Christ. Now, the tribulation saints, you know, what they receive is different, okay? They do die. The rapture saints, we don't die. The tribulation saints, yes, they do die. They're res- they are resurrected at the end of the tribulation period, and their resurrection is like the angels. And I can show you that scripture too, but let's go ahead and go. Let's grab that one that says we are not judged. And look at it. Because I know the scripture says that we will all, it does use the word all, stand before the the judgment seat of Christ and account for our deeds in our body done good and bad. Well, that's not the rapture saints because there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus according to the scripture in Romans. And we'll go through here and pull this scripture and show you that the rapture saints, if you go alive when Jesus comes, you are not going to be judged, which means you don't appear at the beam of judgment. Okay. And when I was studying this, I was, I was, I was crying initially because I was, when the Lord was showing me this, I was bummed (laughs) because I was like, well, if we don't appear at the judgment, you know, what about our crowns and rewards? And he said to me in my heart and in my mind, not something I could hear. Okay. It's like in my spirit, I could just, it's like I could feel him put his hand on my shoulder and say to me, and I I will never forget these words because although it's not scripture, these words came to my mind when I was talking to God about this and that just floored me. And that's exactly what I expect if God's going to speak to me. I expect to be totally amazed by what he has to say. Okay, and it it felt like he put his hand on my shoulder and kind of laughed at me and was like, let me remember exactly his words, because he, what need has my bride of crowns and rewards? She marries, uh, she receives her crown when she marries her king. And what reward can I give her when everything I have is hers? Whoa. And I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I went from just total despair (laughs) to rejoicing and jumping. He's right. He's right. The bride gets her crown when she marries her king, you know, and she has no need of rewards because he's given her everything, okay? And it's the tribulation saints that are going to appear at the beam of judgment. Let's go, I'm I'm going to get you these scriptures that shows, let's start in Matthew, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Now that's indicating right there that it's a possibility that you won't be judged if you're not judging others. Okay? Matthew 7, 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So that is reiterating the scripture. It's 7, 1. Hey, I've been on a very, very... Are we going to a break? Uh, producer, is it time for that already? Okay, well, I guess we are. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Believer Central World Update on Christians United Broadcasting Network. Glory to God. We've got some amazing things happening in the world today, don't we? And we've got some, looks like a little discussion in the chat room. I love it when people, you know, ask questions. Uh, if anybody has a beef in there, spit it out. Let's let's talk about it where I can see it. And um, go ahead and post if you have uh, any kind of a conflict with what I'm teaching here. Because I can prove everything I I talk to you about scripturally. So let's um, let's go back to the scriptures on the judgment. Um, Now, Luke 6.37 really spits it right out. It says here, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Well, if if, if we're all judged, then the scripture is... Is kind of pointless, isn't it? And there's not one single scripture in the Bible that is pointless. They're all important. They all say something vital to us. And this scripture plainly says, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Now, what that tells me is that there is a group who doesn't judge others, and they're not judged. Okay? But that other scripture does say, and we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So what is what how do we reconcile this? 
Well, in many places in the scriptures, it will say we all, when it, but it's not referring to all. It's referring to all of a certain group, okay? Because it can't be all, if you think about it. If it says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, we're not all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The lost aren't going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The, uh, are they? Those who are um, the wicked, you know, they don't stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Those who have already died, they don't. I mean, they're, this can't be all and be all inclusive as meaning all, everybody, everything. You know what I mean? It says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And in the context, it's talking to the tribulation saints. Okay? The tribulation saints are the only ones who stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I didn't know that for years. See, I, for years I thought, okay, I'm trying to earn these five crowns, right? Well, I there's only one crown for the rapture saints. But it's way better than all five of those other ones that are going to be given out uh, during the tribulation to those who appear at the beam of judgment seat of Christ. Because we get our crown when we marry our king, okay? So, and I, I love his appearing, you know, we, I, I don't know how all that's going to work, but what I understand from the scriptures is that we will not be judged because the Lord Jesus Christ was judged on our behalf. So we've already been judged. We're hidden in him. Our lives are hidden in Christ and he was already judged and found perfect. And as we are hidden in him, his judgment applies to our account. And so we are already judged in him. Okay. And let's see, is there another one? Um, it says the prince of this world is judged. You know, so anyway, um, it is the... The tribulation saints are the ones who are judged and appear at the judgment seat of Christ for crowns and rewards. And we know this because they are judged on their works, good and bad. Well, we aren't judged on works. The rapture saints aren't judged on works. It's pure grace, pure blood of the Savior that saves us. Now, the tribulation saints, that's a little bit different story. See, the scripture is saying that they will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ at the beam of judgment. And their, ju their works are judged. See, there's a difference. Our works aren't judged. Theirs are. Okay? We're judged solely on the blood of the Savior prior to the rapture. But during the tribulation period, their works, good and bad, are judged. Let's look at that scripture real quick. Where it says we will all go before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged on our works, good and bad. Now, that's important because that tells us a lot right there. They're judged on their works. Well, the Lord says that we're not judged on ours, lest anyone should boast, right? Okay. Now, it says here in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. See, they are judged on works. They are, can, you know, they are judged on bad things as well as good things. And the, the rapture saints are not. It says, judge not, and you will not be judged. Okay? But it says that all of these in this group are judged. The tribulation saints are judged. The rapture saints are not judged. Now, I'll let me go back over here to... Um, okay. <laughs> oh, did the, did the ones who uh, wanted to argue take off? That does tend to happen. You know, if they feel like they don't have a leg to stand on, they kind of retreat, you know, because they don't, they don't have scripture 
to back up. See, I just explained away the scripture that they use to argue with me. So uh, that does tend to happen. But you know what? Um, That's okay because we're after truth here. You know, and if they have truth, I want to hear what their argument is. Hey, if you have a beef with God or if you just have a beef with me and you don't like me or, and, I mean, that, <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that don't like me. So, you know, Janine says they were adamant with us. Well, did they prove their point with scripture? That's what I want to know. Because, you know, there's a... Uh, that's the only thing that matters is the scripture. I mean, everybody's got an opinion. And so opinions are irrelevant. Now, did they post scripture at all? I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Um, Michelle wants to know if we're taking Skype calls. Um, we Now, I talked to my producer about that. Uh-oh, he's trying to talk to me. What I'm, what's he saying? Uh-oh. He says, bad weather there. Get ready for it. A lot of lightning. Um, okay. We might end up having some communication issues if um, <laughs> if there's a bad storm, lightning storm right there where our network is broadcasting from. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, no scripture? Well, I mean, if they didn't have scripture, I can understand why they left. Because they're just going to get, <laughs> you know, shot down there without scripture. And I got scripture for everything I teach. So bring it on, anybody. If you want to, if you want to challenge what I'm teaching, I bring it on. I'm good with it. I can, you know, I love it when people ask questions, and you know, I love it when these. Religious hypocrites come onto my wall on Facebook and they just are like, shame on you, you know, for teaching this and this and this. And I'm thinking, you know what? <laughs> I don't care what they think. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for people not to like me. I'm prepared for people to hate my guts. They have for ever since I've been standing for Jesus. And, you know, one thing, I want to say one thing. And I may have said this before, but I'm going to say it again. A lot of people who take the position that everybody is going to be judged, there's no pre-trip rapture, that the end of the, you know, the rapture comes at the end, all this, they're always angry. They're always aggressive. They're that I don't ever see fruits of the Spirit, from people who take that position. There's one exception. Jim Cipriani of Watching for Truth Lord. He is a post-tripper. But he is a sweetheart. Okay? He doesn't just stomp on people because they don't see things his way. And he's the only... I'm serious. He's the only pre-tripper... I'm sorry. Post-tripper I'm aware of. That you know will can actually discuss the issue with you in a civil manner and look at the scriptures, but but he and I do you know we've gone over the scriptures and and he sees it the way he sees it and I see it the way I see it, but we're able to love one another you know and have unity between us. It's not the pre-trippers that don't want peace. You know, it's the post-tribbers that get angry. I've yet to see a pre-tribber uh, get angry and try to cram their position down someone's throat. I'm sure, you know, maybe it does happen. Um, Janine wants to know, how can there be a post-tribber? Well, there are three rapture views out there. there you know, now I subscribe to a pre-tribulation rapture because that is... Um, how I can justify through the scriptures. I can't reconcile many scriptures without a pre-tribulation rapture. Now I've tried, I've really, I've looked at their positions and I believe it's possible that there could be, um, well, we know there's a, there's a rapture at the trib midpoint that takes the two witnesses. Now, whether it takes living believers again, I don't know. I have no idea. 
and there it's possible there could be a rapture um you know at the seventh trumpet but that's not the end of the trip okay you still have seven vile judgments to go but at the seventh trumpet there does say that the mystery of god will be finished so what i really think is that you have a pre-tribulation rapture you have a mid-trib rapture and then you have another rapture possibly at the seventh trump so that's the only way to reconcile scripture you cannot reconcile the scriptures without a pre-tribulation rapture now you you can twist them and and you know you can you can make them fit, but you can't make them fit with all of the scriptures. And you cannot, if, if you've got a theory. Oh, we're going to a break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I am finding out the greatness of the loving heart. Thou hast been.
Welcome back to Believer Central World Update on Christians United Broadcasting Network. We're happy to have you. Glory to God. We're having all kinds of fun stuff going on in the in the uh, chat room. Now, they had a question. I'm going to go ahead and answer before we get back to what we were talking about real quick. That um, They were wanting to know, do you have to be baptized? And let's talk about that for a minute. The scripture says, I mean, it, let's just read, let's look at the scripture. That's our final authority for everything. And that way, when we look at the scriptures, we know that it's not opinion. And we know what God has had to say about the matter. So let's do that. Now, we know that the thief on the cross died and was not baptized, but he had the Lord Jesus Christ's personal assurance, personal invitation. His act of faith on the cross was such that Jesus was impressed with him and said, you're going to be with me in paradise. And he didn't have time to get baptized, did he? But... The Lord does want us to be baptized. So let's go down here. It says, Okay. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, it didn't say he that believeth not and is not baptized. But I think that we have enough scriptural evidence there to get baptized. (laughs) If you haven't been baptized, you should. Now, you don't have to go get baptized in a church, okay? You can get baptized in the bathtub at home. Get baptized in a creek, a pool, a lake, any body of water. You should understand fully what you're doing when you get baptized. Looks like we're having some video issues here. Maybe our uh, maybe our network is getting rained on. Some lightning there. Um, oh, now um, I wanted to let you know also. Uh, so my advice to you is if you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, um, study in the word what it means to be baptized. Okay. Um, you should have someone baptize you that knows what they're doing. Okay. That understands, uh, it doesn't have to be a pastor. It just someone who is a believer who understands what baptism means is you, uh, descend into the water. You are dying with Christ. You are It symbolizes your participation in his death as you go under the water. And as you come up, it symbolizes being raised in newness of life with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, you can baptize one another um, if the need arises uh, and you haven't been baptized. You can get baptized at home. You can baptize your kids in the tub. You know, it doesn't have to be in a church. And, but it's important. It's a, it's a public thing, um, in a lot of ways. And, um, it's, it's a good thing to be baptized. If, if you're able to be baptized, see the thief on the cross, he wasn't able to be baptized because he didn't have any time. He was nailed to the cross. But if you've received Christ and you do, you know, have the, the chance, the time to be obedient to God, you should. Okay. You should always be obedient to the scriptures. And it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, baptism doesn't save you. But um, it's an act of obedience. Okay? The Lord says, be baptized, and so you should. Now, if you receive Christ on your deathbed and you have no chance to be baptized, then perhaps your confession as the thief on the cross, you know, if you've not had the chance to be saved. So anyway, I'll...
Okay. Um, we're now able to take calls over Skype, and we do have a caller on the line. Uh, Michelle, welcome to Believer Central World Update. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing, dear? I'm good. How are you? Fine. What's on your mind? Um, actually, I was wondering, you know, I have this thought, you know, frequently about, you know, I get afraid that Jesus is not going to take me. I think about all these bad things that I've done. I think about Jesus not taking me. How do I get over it? Ah, that's a good question. Okay. Well, that's great. I can answer that for you. Um, we have to trust in the blood of the Savior and in His promises. And we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any should boast. Our salvation is based entirely on the blood of the Savior and not our ability to obey, not our ability to um, do good deeds or anything like that. It is based solely on Him. So when we doubt our salvation, we have to catch ourselves and push those thoughts out of our mind because our salvation is not based on us. It's based on, or our abilities, our credibility, it's based on Him, His blood, His credibility. And remind yourself also that if Jesus Christ is going to come here and die, for you. That is the ultimate expression of love. And there is no greater way he could prove his love to us. And we have to ponder in our minds that great love he had for us. And push all the doubts out of our minds. Because if we doubt that he will take us. We're not doubting really our ability to measure up because we already know we don't. We're doubting his credibility and his ability to save us if we have thoughts of, well, maybe he won't take me. Maybe he won't. Uh, maybe I don't measure up. Uh, no, we don't. You're right. We don't measure up. None of us. We, do, we don't measure up. None of us do. And the Lord Jesus Christ knows that. That's why he had to come and die for us. Because we can't do it. We can't do it on our own. None of us. We're all sinners. It takes one sin to make you a sinner. Just like it takes one murder to make you a murderer. And so we're all sinners. We're all liars. We're all adulterers at heart we're all coveters we you know we all break the commandments and and we as we try you know harder to keep them as we grow closer to the lord we're never going to measure up with our actions so it's the only action we're responsible for is to choose jesus and once we choose him we have to put our confidence in his blood and remember before he ever drew you to salvation. He died for you. He knew before he ever died. Every single sin you would ever commit in your entire life. From birth to death. He's already died and forgiven you of sins you haven't committed yet. So have confidence in the Savior. Because his word. You know our salvation is based on believing him. Remember Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him as righteousness. And if we believe him, he says, I died for you. My blood saves you. And I love you. And I'm coming back to rescue you. And we just simply have to accept him and believe him. Now, do you believe him, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. That he's capable of saving you? Yes. That his blood was perfect and paid the price for every one of your sins from birth to death. Yes. Then you're good. Then you're in great shape. I mean, if, if, you're, if your sins are all covered from birth to death, then there's no reason why you wouldn't go, is there? 
No. No? Nope. No reason whatsoever. Your that is your helmet of salvation. The knowledge that assures you that you are saved and that you're okay and you're going. See the the enemy will throw doubts into your mind about your salvation. You know why? Because it makes you ineffective for the kingdom. If you doubt your own salvation, then you, um, you're you not in God's rest. If you doubt your salvation. And you're also, um, you know, keeping yourself from being able to experience the rejoicing over your, over your assurance of salvation. Now, I mean, it's nothing we can do prior to the rapture. It has nothing to do with us. If we receive Christ as our Savior, we're in. And that's, you're in. When the rapture occurs, every single person on the planet who has received Christ as their Savior is going. You know, everyone. Because it's not based on us at all. I mean, thank God for that. (laughs) Because, I, you know, I my list of sins is a mile long, you know. And his blood blotted out all my sins. And I'm so thankful. Thank you, Lord. Because we can't measure up. There's nothing we can ever do to measure up in a million years. We're all miserable failures. We're all sinners. And that's just... And thank God he's not. <laughs> he's... He's perfect and wonderful, and he did it. He conquered death. He paid the price for our sins. And so, does does that answer your question, or did you? Did you yeah, have, yeah, it does. Did you have another question? No, I just wanted to say I told you one day I'd be on TV. Hey, you are on TV, Michelle. God bless you. Wave and say hi to the world. Hi, Liz. I'm on TV. Did you want to say anything? Hi, Mom. <laughs> She's in the other room. Well, you know, she'll you'll get to say hi to her on the recording over and over and over again, too, because the shows are all recorded and archived. So you can pull it up after the show when we post the link on Facebook and you can show your mom that you're on TV and that you said hi to her. Did you want to say anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, well, God bless you, sweetie. And uh, if anybody else has any questions or wants to, we'll see you later, Michelle. God bless you, honey. And on the, uh, if anybody else has any uh, questions, we can take calls on the Skype now. Christians United One is the Skype name, and just uh. Call in, and we'll, uh, oh, we have Becca Simmons on the phone, don't we? Go ahead and put her through, producer. She's wanting to give us an announcement here, too. Hey, Becca, can you hear me, dear? Yeah, I can. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I I do have a question. Okay. Um. We were talking about baptism and Christians being baptized. I know there's a controversy there somewhere out there about being baptized um, or not being baptized uh-huh. prior to going to the Lord. I'm getting an, uh, some feedback. So, echo? I don't know about that. I don't hear an echo, but what is okay. your question, sweetie? Okay, so in... Acts 2.38, it says, And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then later on in Acts 19, Paul says, he's asking those that receive Christ, of what baptism did you get baptized? And they said, John. John's baptism. And then he spoke to them, and they said they went and got baptized in the name of Jesus. So what is the difference then of being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the name of Jesus? Well, there are two baptisms. You know, for everything, there is a carnal and a spiritual. And baptism is no different. You have the baptism by water, which is what John did, to prepare the people to receive the Savior. 
And then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was uh, came upon the disciples at Pentecost. And both are necessary in our walk because the Lord has set up physical parables. That's what all the rituals from the Old Testament were. And John is the last of the prophets, if you would. He was the forerunner prior to the Messiah. And so, in many ways, John is the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, see, prior to the Lord Jesus Christ receiving the Holy Spirit when he was baptized, John was baptizing people by water, showing them that a new life was going to be necessary. That's what baptism symbolizes. When you go down into the water, you're symbolizing aligning yourself with his death. As you come back up, you are rising from the dead with him in newness of life. It's a physical parable, kind of like the rituals from the Old Testament. Now, we are commanded in the scriptures to be baptized. Now, it doesn't specify water baptism or spiritual baptism. So, I'm think I mean, I was baptized in water and by the spirit. And I think that I think that we need to obey the command in the New Testament because it's in the New Testament to uh, be baptized. It says in Mark 16:16, 16, 16, "He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned." Now, I think he's talking about both there right um you know you must be baptized in the spirit you must be born again okay but the water baptism symbolizes the death of this life and the start of your new life in christ and so i i do think that to be safe we have to do both right you know and i I agree i agree i don't now I'm not saying that I'm not saying that you will not be saved if you haven't been baptized. Okay? I'm not saying that to anybody because we know the thief on the cross wasn't able to be baptized. But and, and you know people that come to Christ on their deathbeds are not there's a lot of reasons why people can't be baptized. So I'm not I'm not saying at all that those who haven't been baptized by water are lost at all. I'm just saying that we should Obey the word. Now, we're, we we don't, um, we have to be careful not to think that it is an act on our part that will save us. The baptism. Okay? Right. So, you know, it's not us getting baptized by water that saves us. It's the blood of the Savior and the baptism is symbolic of the being born again. And, but... After Pentecost, I think the water baptism was actually a, um, a another physical parable. It was a lesson to show the people of the spiritual baptism that was going to come after the Lord's death and at Pentecost. Does did that make any sense? Yeah, it actually does because it does sound more spiritual than than <clears throat> what happens when you receive Christ. And if you don't have water there, the ability to be baptized, Christ still brings you in and he accepts you. So that's a good explanation. It's his blood, you know. Yes. Um, if, it's bad, if, if, if it's us going and, you know, immersing ourselves in water that saves us, then it's us doing it and not him. So, you know, it can't right. be that. Right. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> so, yes, tonight... Later oh, on yeah, tonight. I know you, had an, uh, you had an announcement for us. Yeah, um, Lisa's going to be with us at our tiny chat. So it's tinychat.com forward slash out of the darkness. It's O U T T A T H E D A R K N E S S, out of the darkness. And um, at 8 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time and 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. I'm not sure where you fall in the middle of that, Lisa. I think yes, 7. Yes, I do. 7 o'clock my time. I'm really looking forward to that, okay. too, to hanging out with you guys. 
Yeah, so we're going to be worshiping and fellowshipping and just talking about whatever the Lord lays on your heart and ours, and we'll just see where the Lord leads it. I'm looking forward to that. I hope all of you will come over to tinychat.com forward slash out of the darkness at, uh, it's going to be 7 central time, and we would be glad to see you there. So join us, and we'll have a discussion. You can ask your questions, and, and we'll have an awesome talk. I'm really looking forward to it, Becca. Great. We will look forward to seeing you later on. Yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to say? Nope. That's it. God bless that's you all. It. Love God everyone. God bless you, too. God bless you, too. Thanks okay. for calling in. We'll that's talk to problem. you later. Okay. Praise the King. Did we get um, everybody satisfied on the baptism thing? Okay. Now, oh my goodness, the show just goes so fast. Okay. Um. Let's see here. If you. Isn't this cool that we can take Skype calls now? You are welcome to call in, and, and I'm not going to restrict your call. Um, if you want to tell me off or if you don't like God or if you have a beef of some kind, throw it out here. Let's talk about it. We can, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid for people to not like me or to have an argument with me. I mean, Call up. Let's talk about it. And you know, I'll let I'll sit here and let you call me whatever names you want to. And but then, uh, <laughs> hopefully, you'll hear my response too. And my response, hopefully, will not be you know something that irritates you even further. <laughs> it might be though, so be prepared for that. <laughs> Now, you know, we've only got like 12 minutes left. And in this time, I want to I, I want to talk to you about some more about what we were talking about earlier. What are you going to do? Okay? We know that the end times are upon us. The rapture is due at any time, any day, any moment. And what are you going to do? If you're on government assistance of any kind, you need to be considering very seriously, what am I going to do? Because in very short order, the government has already, you know, they tried to get it passed in the Obamacare legislation and it failed, but they wanted um, in the draft that was presented initially to require everyone who receives any kind of government assistance to receive an implant, a mark in their hand or in their forehead. It's time to wake up, loved ones. It's time to smell the roses and see that the end times are here. The rapture could occur any day now. We are in that zone. And I don't know how long we will be. I mean, it, it could last, you know, for a while. It's been looking like these wars are going to blow up in everyone's face any moment. But they won't. Okay? I don't worry about the wars because I know that we're leaving first. And I can prove scripturally the preacher of rapture with 50 scriptures, easy. And the mid-trib and post-trib uh, uh, theories, they just don't reconcile. Now, I'm, I'm not saying there's not a rapture during those times, but it's not, you know, um, oh, that's what you wanted me to say. <laughs> okay, he's pointing me in a direction. I get questions a lot from people who have other than preacher positions and they ask almost the same question every single time. They ask me, why do you think the church is going to escape persecution? (sighs) 
it kills me when people ask me that. But I do like to answer the question because the answer is just so profound. It makes you go, oh, wow. Um, at least it did me when the Lord first explained it to me. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> If you're not being persecuted right now, you're not walking with Jesus. I'll say that again. If you're not being persecuted right now, you are not walking with Jesus. The scripture says, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you're walk, if you're walking with the Savior, you're being persecuted right now. I'm not saying that you're not saved if you're not being persecuted. Because it's the blood that saves you, not your ability to get out there and be persecuted and stand. Okay? So, it's it's the blood only. But when I'm telling people that, you know, uh, it astounds me how many times I'm asked that question. Because these post-tribbers, they feel like pre, pre-tribbers just think that we escape all persecution. Well, that's ridiculous. A quarter million martyrs. Christian martyrs are dying around the world every year. Last year alone, almost a quarter million. The real believers who are walking with the Savior are being persecuted right now. If you're standing for Jesus Christ, you are being persecuted. Okay? If you're not being persecuted, then you're no threat. You're not making any difference for the kingdom. And you're not doing any damage. To the kingdom of wickedness. And the kingdom of darkness. And I want you to think about that real hard. Because the scripture says. All of us. Who will live godly in Christ Jesus. Will be persecuted. So if you are not being persecuted. Take a look at how you're living your life. And if you are still. You know if you're claiming Jesus Christ. And you're still stuck in sin up to your eyeballs. And refusing to forsake your sins, don't be surprised if he chooses to leave you here. There are some who he will choose to leave here. It says in Matthew, when the disciples asked him, Lord, why do you speak to them in parables? Why don't you just tell them plainly? And the Lord Jesus said, it is given unto you to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. He doesn't like them. The Lord's blood is so powerful, it it would save everyone, even the wicked, if he wanted it to. But he does restrict that grace in some areas of his own discretion. Because he, you know, otherwise, um, he's going to have people he doesn't like in his kingdom who won't respect what he says and won't believe him. And so, you know, I mean, we can't expect the Lord... To do anything we wouldn't do ourselves. Now, do you want to invite somebody into your home who doesn't trust you, doesn't believe anything you say, and isn't your friend? I don't, personally. So how could I expect God to do that? I don't expect God to open the his city to the wicked. <laughs> it wouldn't be heaven anymore if the wicked was there, would it? I mean, anyway, (laughs) if you are not being persecuted right now, you're not living for Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean you're not saved, but it does mean that you're not making a dent in the kingdom of darkness. You're no threat. You're not making a difference. Okay? And so, forgive me if that offends anyone, but... um, Oh, Janine says um, all her Catholic family rebukes her. Well, I understand that. There are a lot of real believers in the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church as an organization is wicked. It violates Scripture in so many ways. But, you know, Christian denominations, the organization thereof can also be wicked. As we've seen, the apostasy of the church is falling away. It's 
not religion that saves us. It's the blood of the Savior. Okay? And people need to step out of religion in all its forms. Islam, Catholicism, you know, Christian denominations that are oppressive. Step out of the denominational cage and just read the Bible. Trust the Savior and read the Bible. The scripture says in James that perfect religion is to care for widows and orphans and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And that's what we absolutely must do. I'm so excited to see you guys tonight over at Tiny Chat forward slash out of the darkness. It's going to be fun to hang out with you guys. Feel free to come and join in there and ask your questions. Also, we're able to take your calls on Skype now. If you have a question, feel free to call in. And, you know, if you got something awful to say to me, say it. I'm good with it. Go ahead and say it. I don't have a problem with that. I can, uh, I'm a big girl. <laughs> you know, I can handle it. I don't fight against people. Okay? But if you want, if you got something to say, I'm, say it. I'm good with it. Okay? I don't mind what you say to me. You have to, you know, don't go saying curse words that are not acceptable to all audiences or you'll have to get cut off if you're using bad words. But if you want to disagree with me and if you don't like me, I'm good with it. Say what you want and then I will do my best to answer your question. I'm not going to just cut you off because you disagree with me. I want people to come on here that disagree with me and let's look at the scriptures and find out what the truth is, okay? Because the scripture is the final authority, and I'm a big girl. I can handle it, you know, with, for someone to disagree with me. I, I have no problem with that, and it doesn't it doesn't upset me or, or offend me. So, by all means, call in and tell me what you think. I'm good with that. Even if you don't have a question, you just want to tell me you don't like me. <laughs> you know, fine, call in. I don't care. It just cut, you know, I at least you're participating that way, aren't you? And you're, you know, listening to the word of God, and that's all that matters. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, if people like me or anything about me. I'm nothing. I'm dust. I'm vapor. I'm I'm nobody. It's about Jesus Christ. Okay, it's all about him. That's the whole reason we're here. And he is able to save us. Oh, my goodness. It's already time to go. I love you guys so much. God bless you. And we will see you tomorrow if the Lord tarries here, there, or in the air. God bless you.